All right, Paleo Hackers, I am joined here with Lierre Keith, American writer and activist, here today to talk about her book, The Vegetarian Myth. The Vegetarian Myth. Lierre, thanks for coming on. Good to have you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. And um, The Vegetarian Myth, right off the bat, it's a pretty catchy title, hits you in the face. Um, we don't have to spend too much time here, but... I know you weren't always the person who could write the vegetarian myth book. <laughs> um, can you kind of set, set up the call for us? Talk about your journey a little bit to writing that book. Right. So I was a vegan for 20 years. Um, so I have been as far into that world as really you can get. Um, and in the end, the only thing that really pulled me out was that my health collapsed completely. And I think for a lot of people, that is the only thing that gets them out. Um, and because I had that kind of collapse, I mean, the thing about being a vegan is that it's not just what you eat. You know, it really becomes who you are. So you go through this tremendous um, just existential crisis, really, about who am I and what is the universe and why am I here and what does it mean that um, everything that I thought was true has led me so far astray that hmm. I have now permanently damaged myself. And so you're really stuck. Um, for a year or two with no answers at all about your place in anything. So at that point, I ended up um, having to look at a lot of information that I had done my best not to examine over that 20 years. Because my interest in things like sustainability and planetary justice had never stopped. It's just I had stopped engaging with information that was contrary to my vegan ideology. Sure. So all that information was there. I just had to finally look at it. So that was it's a long and hard process for a lot of us. Nobody gives up being a vegan easily. Yeah. And at the end of it, I ended up writing that book because, well, a couple of reasons. One is I wanted other very idealistic young people to understand that this was not actually going to address the problems they saw with the world. Um, and that, in fact, if they had bigger information, they might make a different decision than going vegan. And also, I wanted to explain to them that they were probably going to hurt their health and that, that it could be permanent if they did it long enough. So I kind of wanted to save them from what I had done to myself. Right. But, it, I mean, my whole generation tried it. I mean, everybody I know tried being either vegetarian or vegan, and we all ended up coming out the other end with horror stories about you know what we had done to our bodies. And there's no reason for people who are 20 to go through that. We've already tried it. You know, it didn't work. So all of that was the reason that I wrote the book. So I'm curious, when you say like your health collapsed, mm -hmm. what, what were some of the health complications you noticed? Right. So um, first off, I ended up with really bad blood sugar issues, which is very common. Um, and I would say I pretty well destroyed my insulin receptors because I did it for so long. But you'll, you'll find out right away that you know you, the human body is really not meant to take that load of sugar every day. And you know, every time that you eat that kind of high carb, low fat diet, mm -hmm. you're putting incredible stress on your body because it's a biological emergency. You know, our brains can only survive at a very narrow range of blood sugar. So too high or too low. And your body has to mobilize some pretty intense uh, chemicals to deal with it. And, you know, that includes starting with insulin, but also adrenaline. So you're on this constant roller coaster where your blood sugar is either too high, too high or too low. Hmm. So you're constantly having to eat then to get your blood sugar back up. Well, then the whole spike starts all over again. And you do wear out everything inside your body when you're doing that on a, on a constant basis, which I was. So that was the first thing was I started to have these terrible um, insulin crashes. And I didn't know what that was. I just yeah. knew that I felt like if I didn't eat, I was going to fall over dead. Um, and, you know, that actually is true. It's a biological emergency. So that was the first problem. But Did, did that feel like brain fog or what was that feeling like? I didn't get the fall? brain fog so much, but I got that horrible, like, hangry feeling yeah. where yeah. I was in a horrible mood, um, angry, upset, wanted to cry all the time. And then if I would eat, I would feel better in 20 minutes. But, of course, two hours later, I was right back where I started. Hmm. Um, you know, and you get shaky and sweaty and you can't figure out what's wrong you just know that you have to eat i mean your your cravings for food are just insane all the time yeah and yeah. that's why it's because you're not keeping that blood sugar stable okay, so that okay. was problem number one um i but th that a lot of times will go will go away if you end up understanding what you've done and you take on some version of a low carb diet you can at least clear that problem from your plate and my problem was i did it so long that i'm sort of stuck forever eating a very low carbohydrate level because I don't want to become insulin dependent, you know, as a diabetic. So it's, I have to be really, really careful about that one. Yeah, um, yeah. But the, the more, um, 
the longer term damage I did is I ended up with degenerative disc disease in my spine. So my spine's basically coming to pieces. And these kinds of mm-hmm. joint problems are very classic, first of all, for anybody who eats an agricultural diet. So you don't see this in skeletons, you know, in the, in the, from the Paleolithic age. The moment people take up agriculture, of course, they shrink six inches, their teeth fall out, and you end up with these terrible joint and bone problems all across the archaeological record. So, I mean, just to say it very bluntly, the I did not have to end up with this disease. I mean, I did this to myself, you know, and so I have um, a lot of physical constraints on my activity level, and I will always be in pain. I mean, for the rest of my life, wow, I can wow. have as much morphine as I want because it's all they can do for me is painkillers. I'm there's there's no surgery that helps this. I'm done. I did myself in, and I've gotten any number of emails from. Um, ex-vegans vegans and vegetarians who did the same thing. They wrecked their spines, their hips, their knees, and now they're my age, and it's bad, you know? And, and what, what exactly does that with, like, the vegan diet or a vegetarian diet? Is the lack of B12, or I'm not familiar with how that sure. happens? So, especially for the vegans, the, there's, there's, the problem is twofold. Um, problem number one is that the only way you can actually absorb minerals out of your digestive tract is if there's fat. Dietary fat is actually what drives that process. Huh. And when you're eating vegan or any kind of that, you know, high carb, low fat diet, you simply don't have enough fat to absorb the minerals. So even if you're eating plenty of them, there's no way for them to get into your bloodstream. So it's problem number one. Problem number two is the diet itself is actually very low in minerals. Um, there aren't a lot of minerals in plant foods. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, the, the foods that we know of that are very high in minerals are, of course, red meat. That's where you're going to get them. And to go one level further, the kinds of traditional food practices that we've all lost track of um, in the United States. So it's things like bone broth, which, of course, traditional people around the world understand as really vital to health. Or and livers or most, organs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all that stuff. And those are very, very dense with minerals. So the moment you go vegan, all that's just... It's not even a concept that you would eat those things. So I'm not getting any minerals. I'm not, I don't have any way to absorb the, what minerals I am getting. And then you add another problem, which is, you know, we've all been told to eat, quote, healthy whole grains. Well, the problem with grains is that they're seeds. And they come armed with ways to keep animals from eating them, right? This hmm. is the plant's baby. This is the only way the species is going to survive. Right, and right. they are preloaded with ways to hurt us if we eat them to make themselves inedible to us so that they can survive, right? So there's a whole range of things called anti-nutrients that are in every single seed you might eat, and that, of course, includes grains. Um, There are ways to try to um, kind of manipulate around seeds so that they become more edible, but I didn't know that as a vegan. Um, All I knew was you were supposed to eat healthy whole grains, and so I ate a ton of brown rice and whole wheat and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is that one of the anti-nutrients that are in Um, whole grains and beans um, actually block the absorption of minerals. That's one of the ways that seeds fight back. Wow. So eating all those healthy whole grains, in fact, man, I wasn't getting any minerals at all. And what few minerals I was getting in my little food stream, um, you know, all the minerals were blocked from being absorbed. So that's like a one, two, three punch for no minerals, end of your joints and bones. And this is why so many of us ended up with these really kind of profound joint problems. Yeah. So the demineralization of your body uh, depleted yes. the minerals, and that can really affect your bo- bones, joints, yep. and your teeth. skeletal system, yep. teeth. I okay. know a lot of ex-vegans who um, destroyed their teeth. You wow. know, 18 months into being a vegan, their teeth were falling out of their heads. Never had a cavity. Now they've got 27 cavities. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. You can remineralize your teeth. There's some ways to repair that. Sometimes it's too late. Um, mm. But in terms of joints, you know, joints are so poorly vascularized that once you kill them, it's pretty much over. And is this like your work and more people are they speaking out about dangers or at least uh, kind of how to prevent the teeth falling out if people are <laughs> vegetarian or vegan? Or is it still pretty like shameful to talk about? giving up going vegan or vegetarian like you quit the club or or is it becoming more and more common to talk out against it or I, you can answer def- that any way you want yeah there are definitely people who've come out the other side who talk about all this very publicly um, but you have to look for them if you're inside that vegan world still you'll never find them um, if they are mentioned they are treated with utter contempt 
and there'll be some, you know, various websites that will put up the debunk on whoever. Um, and right. so you don't have to look any further. Um, and that's really a shame because as their health starts to decline, a lot of these people don't know where to go. You know, they've kind of wrapped themselves up into this cult-like atmosphere and it's really hard to step outside and start looking for the alternate information. And I have a lot of compassion because I was there, you know, for 20 years. Yeah. I was terrified to look outside, even though I, on some level, you know, this is not working. You shouldn't feel this bad at age 25 or age 30. Um, and so it's, it's really hard. So, uh, we were talking about physical markers, you know, mm-hmm. like just you personally, your bones not being healthy anymore and some other vegans or vegetarians as well. What are some of the reasons to eat meat beyond just minerals or I guess the proof or, um, trying to find the right way to word that, you know, like why should we eat meat? What are the benefits of it? Okay. So, um, Two and a half million years ago is when the genus Homo arrived on the plains of Africa. And over the next million, million and a half years, our cranial capacity doubled and our digestive tracts shrunk. Um, So our brains got gigantic. And in fact, they need 25% of our energy goes directly to your brain. So this is a really energy heavy organ. Um, It needs a lot of fuel. But we have short digestive tracts, and that was the trade-off. The only reason that that, the only way that can work is if we're eating really, really nutrient-dense food, okay? Because we, we don't have, you know, the, the capacity of, say, a ruminant or even an orangutan. If you think about um, a primate like an orangutan, you think of a giant barrel torso with kind of skinny arms and legs, right? right? The reason that big barrel is there is because they have a completely different digestive system than we do. And they can digest leaves all day long hmm. um, and turn it into the foods that they need. We don't have that capacity. We don't or, have that big Or like barrel. cows have five stomachs. Cow, four, four stomachs, four yeah. Stomachs. And well, what's interesting, I mean, both the orangutan and the cow example, what those animals are actually doing, they're not actually digesting all that cellulose. So leaves or grass or whatever they're chewing, they're feeding that to the bacteria that live inside their bodies. Huh. The bacteria are actually doing the digesting for them. And then they are eating the bacteria. So they take this Whoa. really nutrient-poor substance, just pure cellulose, and they Whoa. actually turn it into high-fat, high-protein bacteria, which is what they digest. Wow, so that's sort of, crazy. Yeah, I know. I mean, they're sort of doing you know, their own sort of hunting, gathering, farming inside their own bodies. Yeah. And you will find these sort of correspondences of this sort of web of life, no matter where you look in nature. I mean, we're all dependent on each other, right? But that's what's actually going on inside those animals. And we don't have the capacity to do that. We have the digestive system of a carnivore. We have a very acidic stomach, and that's for splitting protein, Hmm. you know? Um, So we don't do that vast fermentation. We just do, give me the stuff, I'll break it down and absorb it. Um, And so what you find in the archaeological record is until about 10,000 years ago, um, the very first tools we ever made were hunting tools and butchering tools. Um, the very first wooden spears we ever made were used that we ever found and we've ever been found were used to kill an elephant. That was, um, 500 million years ago. And the tools that they found are actually still coated in that animal fat. And they're not only surrounded by the bones, but they're actually, there's no question what these tools were used for. And of course the first art we ever made was the animals we were eating and it's hunting scenes on the caves of France and Spain. Um, and the animal bones are right there as well. Um, and also you can do chemical analysis of ancient teeth and, uh, the, it's quite clear that what we were eating was, uh, ruminants that were surviving on grasses. And that's from the isotope analysis, which gets complicated, but that's just the take home point. Yes, we were eating large ruminants that lived on the African savanna. And that was how we got these giant brains, very nutrient dense food, easy for us to assimilate with short digestive tracts. And as a result, our brains doubled and we became human. I was reading the book uh, Sapiens. Have you read that one? Yeah, it's a good one. That's yeah. a great book. And yeah. I, I kind of, for the last, I don't know, four years or so, I felt intimidated by all the uh, history of human evolution and everything. There's just so many dates. But uh, this book puts it in a really layman's terms and kind of walks you through it. And it was so fascinating. But one of the things in there he was talking about was how the inv- or how the power to harness fire really... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. bumped us up to the top it, of the food chain yeah that we as soon as we could control that we can cook and that's a much more efficient way of getting nutrients out of food 
uh, than, you know, eating it all raw, putting it through our bodies, having it digest it, kind of like the orangutan. Um, now we can just get extract more nutrition. And the fire was really what bumped us to the top there. And it's one reason why, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the vegetarians have an argument that our teeth don't look like dogs' teeth, and that's why uh, we're not actually carnivores. And what they're missing in this is the role that fire played that we probably would have teeth that look more like carnivore teeth, except for two things. And one is the tools we made, and two is fire, which hmm. is a tool. But if, I mean, we had brains that were big enough to make these kinds of tools. And so instead of growing them in our mouths, you know, we learned how to make them and use them with our hands. Um, and so that would be the knives, the spears, the arrows, the butchering tools, all that stuff. Um, and then fire, of course, made that food more digestible, so we don't need the exact teeth that dogs have. We also domesticated dogs. I mean, and the first yeah. reason we did that was to help us hunt. And it's a great pairing. You know, yeah. it worked for the dogs and it worked for us. And I have two dogs. I can tell you it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a great little combo, you know, dogs and humans. But it's worked for them as well. So, But that's why. So, yeah, they have teeth like that. We don't need them. And that's the part that the vegetarians, I think, miss. But to get back to your other question, so because we you know, evolved eating all this meat, it means that there are a whole bunch of nutrients we really can only get in the quantities we need by eating meat. So you can start with the protein itself. Um, protein from meat has all the amino acids you need in the exact proportions that the human body needs them. Um, not true for plant foods. None of them are complete. And the proteins that do exist come wrapped in cellulose because they're plants um, and we don't really have a mechanism to digest cellulose. So even if those proteins were more complete, we can't really access them well because we can't get to them. Um, and that's why it's called, you know, poor quality protein when you eat those kind of proteins. It's, you really can't get to them. Yeah. So that's problem number one. Uh, problem number two is the fats. Um, there are fats that are only available in animal products. You cannot get them in plants. Plants don't need them and they don't make them. And that includes vitamin D. It includes vitamin A. Um, good quality K2. You can get a little bit in plants, but mostly you got to get it from animals. Hmm. And a lot of people get confused because they say, well, what about carrots? Now, the thing about the vitamin A that's in carrots is that it's not in a form that humans use easily. It's proto-vitamin A. It's a, it has to be converted in our bodies to the form that we actually use. And there are human beings who cannot do that conversion. They are missing the enzyme. Um, and the reason they're missing the enzyme is that in their history, um, in their family history, in their ancestral history, there was so much vitamin A in their diets that they didn't need that enzyme anymore. And evolution is very good at pruning branches. The moment there was enough vitamin A that we didn't need that enzyme, a whole bunch of people stopped making it. Why make it if you don't use it? Fine, we drop it. So if you're from an island or a coastal people, like for instance, you're Irish, um, you may be one of those people who doesn't need that enzyme, doesn't make that enzyme, and if you don't eat actual vitamin A, you can die. And these people are called obligate carnivores because there's no other option for them. Um, even those of us who do have that enzyme, it's not an easy conversion. You have to eat about eight times as much protovitamin A to convert to the amount of vitamin A that you actually need. The very young and the very old often can't do it at all, even if during middle age they're able to do it. So vitamin A is a real problem. Um, and you know, a lot of vegans won't tell you the truth about this, but you need to supplement vitamin A if you're trying to eat a, a plant-based diet. Carrots will not do it. So with vitamin, with all the vitamin and uh, mineral deficiencies, is it enough? If you do want to commit to being vegetarian or vegan, can you just supplement all of those if that's really what you want to do? So two problems. One is that that's honestly part of the definition of an eating disorder. If you think that supplements can replace food, um, I mean, if you go and read a definition, you'll find that in there. So you're wow. walking on some kind of, it's very, it's a tightrope. Yeah. You know, it's not a particularly healthy way to approach food. Um, the other problem is that, you know, even if it's made in a lab, it doesn't necessarily match what we find in the kinds of foods, actual food that people have been eating for two and a half million years. There's all kinds of interactions between, um, you know, something that you might eat and the way that those vitamins are chemically, how they look, it's going to be a little different than what's produced in a lab. And we don't know long term, you know, whether that's good enough. A lot of times it's not. Um, and I just, I just would, especially if I had children, I would feel very funny. Um, I would have a lot of questions about whether or not this was actually a healthy way forward. Well, I'll just get it in a capsule instead and hope for the best. It's made in a factory. It's not made in forests and prairies and in rivers and oceans. Like it, where is there a factory in our ancestral history, and why would you trust that? So 
I don't think it's I don't think it's it's better than nothing if you're committed to that diet, but I don't actually think it's a healthy way forward. Okay. What about with the fat issue, like avocados or coconut mm-hmm. oil? Is that enough, or do you need animal fat specifically? Those things are, um, are certainly better than industrial seed oils, um, and it may be the only fats that vegans are willing to eat that is at least a little bit appropriate for the human template. So a lot of times when confused people write to me and they're you know having a hard time with this, that's one of the things I'll tell them is all right. Well, at least for now, take out all the soy. You know, take out this, this, and this. Um, and instead, try to eat coconut oil every day. Avocados are really good for you. You're willing to eat that, so eat those. But those products, those foods do not contain vitamin A. They do not contain vitamin D. And they still don't have a really great omega-6, omega-3 balance. Um, hmm. So it, they're not perfect. You know, yeah, It's yeah. things to think about, especially if you're still kind of in vegan world. But um, it's it's not ideal. Okay. Um, so talking then about like some big... Um, like with veganism, there seems to be, uh, and I've never been vegan or vegetarian, but I know the China study is like the big mm-hmm. gold standard, and that's been debunked essentially. But I'm st- I'm still kind of confused on. Can you talk a little bit about the China study and and I guess why that was such a big deal, and then why it may might not be relevant? Right. So the problem with that kind of, it's really just a survey. It's not even really a study is that there are so many variables that go into trying to figure out, you know, on a broad level, what people are eating and what effect that might have on their health, that you can't really draw the kinds of conclusions that he drew. Um, And anybody who has any background in actual science knows that. So why it is that his book got published is kind of a mystery to me. I don't know why they didn't have some kind of educated readers look it over first. Because you just can't draw those kinds of conclusions. Um, what were some of the conclusions that were in the well, book? Well, I mean, his main conclusion is if you eat any animal products at all, you are going to get cancer. Huh. Um, and this is just silly. Um, and a lot of it was based on uh, previous research he had done where he had rats in a laboratory or mice. And he – I can't remember which it was. And he adjusted the various – amino acids in their diets and was able to either get them to grow cancers or to stop growing cancers. And this is a true fact. We know that this happens with rats and mice. They're very prone to cancer and you can do this by turning on and off their various amino acids. But um, in nature, you don't actually eat an amino acid. I mean, this doesn't really relate to how people live in the world and the kinds of foods that we eat. You don't get one amino acid. You get a whole complement of amino acids when you're eating any food, right? So this doesn't really relate to anything that anybody would ever eat except outside of a laboratory. And how he can then say, well, because I gave them this amino acid, that means you should never eat dairy or you're going to get cancer. It just doesn't even make any sense. Um, And the best, if people are really curious about the China study stuff, the best person to look at is Denise Minger, M-I-N-G-E-R. And she spent months pouring through the China study. And she actually got the research volume that, that you can get separate from it that actually has all his numbers. And she uh, kind of redid all the calculations in the book. And Colin, T. Colin Campbell didn't even discover what he said he did. Like, his numbers don't even match. Wow. I mean, it's like the whole thing just kind of falls apart the further into it you get. Yeah. Um, so anyway, those are just a few things about it. But I, it really scares me that people are making major life decisions based on a book like that. Is it still pretty popular? or has, It is amongst vegans. You know, it's kind of their Bible because it's the first thing anybody says when they're upset with me is, but the China study, the China study. Okay. So it's still and, floating out there. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Well, I, I know one of the big reasons. Um, okay. So my sister is experimenting with vegetarianism, veganism. She's probably early 20s mm-hmm. now. I think she's exactly 20. And she watched a few documentaries on it. Right. And, you know, it's all about factory farming and the dangers sure. of it. And I know that's a huge reason why a lot of people are drawn to veganism, vegetarianism, is because they don't want to hurt animals sure. and they love animals. Do you think those two things are mutually exclusive, loving animals and eating them? Or what's your take on the whole ethical issue? Sure. So I think factory farming is something we can all agree on. That it's just horrible to keep sentient beings in those kinds of conditions. And this is something really that I think vegetarians, vegans, animal rights people, paleo, traditional food people really should all be working together on. 
And I'm happy to work with anybody on those issues because it's really horrible. I mean, it's one of the main reasons I went vegan as well. Um, the problem is that a lot of those people are so ideological that they won't work with anybody else on it. And it's too bad because we could be getting a lot further, you know, if we would all work together. But that aside, um, the problem here is a lack of information. And it's a, a grave misunderstanding about the nature of agriculture itself. So, so this can't really be done in a soundbite. You have to really understand what we've done to the planet by doing agriculture. Hmm. Um, so agriculture is the most destructive human activity. That's it. I mean, we've skinned the planet alive. And so you have to understand what it is. You take a piece of land and you clear every living thing off the land. And I mean down to the bacteria, right? And then you plant it to human use. So it's biotic cleansing. So all those plants and animals now have nowhere to go because we've taken over that land and we're only growing corn or soy or wheat or whatever for yeah, humans. Yeah. Um, and 98% of the world's old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies have been devastated by this process. Um, there's no way you can look at that level of mass ext extinction and say, this is good for animals. That's the problem. And the answer to this is certainly not factory farming. Um, but to think that, you know, if you're looking at your plate and you don't see dead animals, to then assume that there are no dead animals involved is a grave misapprehension about the nature of the problem. It is way bigger than what's dead on your plate. You have to ask what died to get this food on, the, on my plate. And if you're eating agricultural foods, the answer is the entire planet. Hmm. Okay, it's not just a, a few individual animals. It's not even just a species. It's not even an entire biome. It's actually the process of life itself. Okay, yeah. vertebrate evolution has not come to a halt, and it's because of agriculture, because humans have taken over all that land, and there isn't enough land left now for evolution to actually continue. Just like with the monocropping and the, the oh, yeah. scale we're doing it on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a, just an inherently destructive process, and um, you know we've had 10,000 years and we've trashed the planet. Yeah. So the only, way, the only way out of this is, first of all, we're going to have to reduce our numbers to something sustainable. Um, and second of all, we have to repair what we've destroyed. And then we're going to have to take our place as members of those biotic communities once more. Instead of imposing ourselves across it, which is what we've done by doing agriculture, we need to be participants once more inside those cycles. Yeah. I, I was reading that there's something like, I think it's 8 million acres of lawn in the United <laughs> States, and that if everyone turned their lawn all 8 million acres of it, we could feed the entire uni United States without a farm out there. Um, I don't really want to turn my lawn into a farm, but uh, that's a cool statistic to put it in perspective that when we think we need like gigantic farms to ramp up food production for everyone, sometimes smaller farms can still produce a lot of food as well. Yeah, we have a, as much lawn in the United States as the entire country of India has in agricultural production. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah, that's a, that's a serious stat right there. Um, so what should we be eating then, you know, if we do want to get behind the um, the moral ethics of vegan, vegetarian, or I guess what do you eat? Mm -hmm. Because I know you're still an animal lover. It's not like you, you know, said, I, I hate animals all of a sudden, now I'm going to eat them. <laughs> um, it's still a big part. So what is it, what does your diet look like now? Well... We have Paleolithic bodies, so we need to eat Paleolithic foods. That just kind of makes sense, right? I mean, the moment that people take up agriculture, you know, you can see in the archaeological record the number of diseases that take hold. Um, and anybody who's a medical anthropologist or an archaeologist can look at a bone, and they'll tell you in 10 seconds whether it's from a hunter-gatherer or from an agri agriculturalist, because the the bone the difference in you know the health of the bones is just so profound it's it's obvious immediately and that um, that's from like what we were talking about earlier with the demineralization mm -hmm. and all that what we we're talking yes, about yes and i mean even it, uh, iron deficiency anemia would be so bad that it literally caused bone changes especially in children um so yeah the lack of minerals the lack of the the vitamins that actually put those minerals to use to build things like bone and teeth, um, all of that just disappears overnight. And then instead of animal foods, the cereal grains displace that and people's health just falls to pieces. We actually have a concept that's called the diseases of civilization. Hmm. Okay. There are no corresponding diseases of hunter-gatherers. This is just an absolute disaster for human health, for the planet, for everything. Um, so, yeah, so I try to eat a, a paleo diet. Um, so I'm going to walk you two through scenarios. There's, you have an acre of land. 
Um, and so in one scenario, this is what you can do with that acre of land. You can clear all the life off it. Just clear every last thing off it. Now you've got bare ground and you can plant your corn. Now you plant the corn. So what happens in the meantime, you're destroying the topsoil because it's been exposed, right? It's, it's exposed to, 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 to wind, to rain, to, so, you know, to the sun. And like us, when the soil is exposed, it dies. This is an emergency for the planet when you have exposed soil. It only happens in floods or fires, right? We've done this on purpose. It's a war against the planet. So we've exposed the soil. It's now dying. Um, another problem is that you've planted your corn great, but the roots of annuals are very shallow. Annual plants do not live long. They live a very short time, just two or three seasons. They don't have time to, to have deep roots. The deep-rooted plants are the perennial plants. So the trees and the, and the perennial grasses, they have really, really deep root structures. And what that means, uh, a few very important things for the, the, the life of this planet. Um, the first thing is that is what makes the, those roots make the channels that rain uses to enter the soil. So without those channels, uh, the rain just runs off. Oh, fascinating. So, yeah. So now it, what should be a great big sponge for the life community is completely dry all the time. It just the, the rain just never enters. It doesn't huh. charge the water table. It doesn't fill up in the soil. There's not enough. And so when summer comes and things are hot and dry, in a perennial system, you know, whether it's a forest or a grassland, those plants, you know, will draw that water back up and make it available to the other creatures. Uh, with, but there's nothing to do that. There are no plants that can do that, and there's no water there to do it from. So big problem there. Um, and another, you know, major crisis for life on Earth is that it's only the perennials that can get down to that rock, that substratum of rock, break up that rock and bring those minerals up to the surface where the rest of us need them. Uh, you and I cannot eat rock, right? We don't go no, out for breakfast to crunch on rock. Um, but that's who does that. Is It's the, the perennial roots in conjunction with a bunch of other microscopic creatures, the mycorrhiza, the bacteria. They produce the acids that actually do it. And in exchange for some sugar, uh, they will make those minerals available to the plants. The plants bring them up and the rest of us have access to them in one way or another. Without that, all those cycles just grind to a halt. There's wow. no way to access that rock. So minerals and water, right? You can't yeah, have yeah. life without them. Now, none of that becomes available. When you have your acre of corn, you're mining the soil. You're taking out what few minerals are left, and every year you're taking out more and more until there's none left. Okay, and the entire okay. thing just collapses. So in the meantime, where has all that topsoil gone? Well, it's gone into the air as dust particles. It's also run off into whatever local waterways exist. So now you've destroyed the local streams and rivers as well. All the fish are gone because they've been killed by this runoff of topsoil. Um, you've basically killed everything. There's nothing left. And the truth about civilizations which is the, the way of life based on agriculture, um, they last between 800 and 2,000 years. They last until the soil gives out. At that point, there is a major collapse. And this has been the pattern of every single civilization that's ever existed. And that's why. It's a destructive process. So you can do all that, and you can get your acre of corn for a few hundred years, um, and then you can decide, hey, this corn is so cheap because of um, all of the... Uh, the fertilizer that we are now making from um, oil and gas, the fossil fuel fertilizer, um, which has driven the price of corn below the cost of production. That's what it's done. Now it's so cheap. Why don't we take that super cheap corn and we'll feed it to a cow who's living essentially in a city, you know, on a no, cement no. floor in a metal building with a bunch of other crowded cows. We'll feed her that corn. We'll make some really cheap beef because it'll make her fat really fast. And then at the end of the day, we'll kill that cow and feed it to people. Now, this meat is going to be really sick. It doesn't have the right amino acid profile. It doesn't have the right um, omega-6, omega-3 balance. The fatty acid profile is all wrong, too. That cow is miserable the entire time. Feed it to people. Make them sick because it's not really right for people either. What you've created is death and misery the entire way on that acre of land. Okay, that's where we are now. And what the vegans say is, gosh, from that cow onward is really bad. Well, yeah, that is really bad. But back that up because the entire thing is crazy, right? With, with and it depleting. has no future. Yeah. Start from the very beginning. Why did you kill that ecosystem? Right. It's dead, right? And this is the planet now. All right, another scenario. Same acre of land. You leave it alone. It's got 25 different plants per square meter. There are tiny little animals we can't see. There is gigantic megafauna that we think are magnificent. In between, you have uh, reptiles and birds, and you have amphibians, and everybody's living there, and evolution is taking place. Everybody has a home, right? And also what you have there on that 
that prairie on that grassland are some ruminants because ruminants are the only creatures that really can digest that grass and make those uh, nutrients available again to the cycle of life. You have to understand life on a grassland, on a prairie, it's very dry. That's why it's not a forest, Hmm. right? And in those long summer months when there is no rain, what keeps the cycle of life moving is the activity of those ruminants. Uh, They make moisture available. They keep the bacteria alive by giving them a home inside their own bodies. On the surface of the soil, life pretty much goes dormant. If it wasn't for those ruminants, it would turn into desert. Okay, that's absolutely crucial. You cannot have grasslands without ruminants. Um, So you keep that acre exactly as it is. All of those creatures there are doing their part to keep the cycle of life moving, to keep nutrients moving, to recycle carbon, water, all of it, nitrogen. It's all moving. Um, And at the end of that same year, you take a ruminant, you kill her, you feed her to humans. We have a role to play too, right? Life as a whole continues though. We eventually die as well. We become part of that cycle. Our bodies are taken up. Every last piece of carbon is taken up by the next living creature in that cycle. And in the end, the soil eats us all. So it's not like it stops with us. We are part of that cycle too. And that's the creature that we eat. And then in the next time, we are eaten by someone else. That could go on until the sun burns out. The only difference year to year is there's a little more topsoil, which is to say life has a little more resilience, mostly because of the action of those grasses and those ruminants. So those are your options, right? You've got the death that's killing everything, and you have the death that makes more life year after year. Is it those are the current options, or maybe those, like, is it too late for that second option since we've already poured concrete everywhere and kind of monocropped and <laughs> destroyed the I prairies? I think it's too late. I refuse to believe that it's too late. So if we took all of the trashed out agricultural land right now around the world, um, in fact, we'd only have to do this about 80% of it. And we uh, restored the prairies and the grasslands that really do want to come home. And also... Uh, restored the ruminants that need to live there that actually make those cycles happen. Um, We could, in under 15 years, sequester all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age. In fact, the carbon would drop to 330 parts per million. Now, 350 is the red line, right? Above that, we are in danger Mm. as a planet. Um, And you know it's hit 400 now, so we are way above the red line. But even in 15 years, um, if we were just to repair... um, we could do it. I don't think that it's too late. I think that the grasses and the ruminants, um, you know, they still have a dog in this fight. They really do want to come home. And, um, you know, that's what they do. They build soil and the building block is carbon. So I don't think this is too late. Right now, every single institution is headed in the wrong direction. That's the problem. What are we subsidizing in the United States, the U.S. Department of Agriculture? Who gets the subsidies? I'll tell you who gets the subsidies. It's those giant grain producers. There are six corporations that essentially control the world food supply, and that's what they produce, is corn, soy, wheat, rice, and a ton of that goes to animals because it's so cheap. It's not the the natural diet of a cow. We're killing these cows by doing it. What we've done is we took 60 million incredibly healthy bison on the Great Plains. All of them were eradicated, and what we are now producing instead is 40 million really sick cows. It doesn't even make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, it takes something like 2,400 gallons of water to feed one pound of factory farm cow or something crazy like that. Yeah, and that's like because that. of all the water that goes into the corn. It's not because she drinks that much water. I yeah. mean, no one drinks that much water. Um, but it's because of factory farming. The so this is the other thing. Like, all the, the statistics you're going to hear from vegetarians and vegans are true, but it's only true about factory farming. Yeah. Okay. Which we can all agree is wrong. Right. 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 And there's there's a better way out there, which is the way that we lived for two and a half million years. We were participants in those cycles. We were not monsters and destroyers. It's only when we took up agriculture that we became this destructive. So what do you recommend like we do to help uh, the second scenario of those two? How do we get behind it? How do we get involved? What do you what is Lier's recommendations? (laughs) Um, So a number of things. There's things you can do on a personal scale, which are great, and they will help you. And then there are ways to get involved politically, which I think is even more important. Um, Personally, buy as much grass-fed, pasture-raised animal products that you can from small farmers in your region. And this has actually gotten easier and easier. In the last decade, so many people have gotten on board with this, and so many new small farms have um, sprung up who can make a living doing this because more and more people understand how important it is. So one of the best websites you can go to is called eatwild.com. 
and it's run by a woman named Joe Robinson. She's written, I think, two books as well about this. But you can go state by state, click on your state, and look at all of the different grass-based farms where you can go directly and buy food. So you can get beef, you can get pork, you can get chicken, turkey, you can find raw milk, you can find cheese, and you can rest assured that you can go there and visit, see with your own eyes how well they're doing. You can ask them questions. These people are very keen on talking to the public. They understand how important it is. And you can know that you are actually repairing the world. You're repairing the water table. You're repairing the rivers and streams. You're building topsoil. You're making a home for so many other animals that have nowhere to go, birds and fish and amphibians and reptiles and the small mammals. It's just everybody needs to live there. And these are the people who are doing that repair. And they're also making food for humans. That's perfect. It's, I mean, there's nothing better than grass-fed beef or bison for the human body. It's got everything we need. It's a mono food. You could live on that alone. Well, if you're willing to eat some of it raw, you could. Hmm. Um, you absolutely could. And people have. So it's just a fact. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the best place to go, eatwild.com. And make a commitment to doing that. It may mean that you have to you know, take more time out of your life to get that food. You may have to get a giant freezer or figure out how to you know, make jerky in your backyard. All of that is fun. You can do all that. Um, and more and more, it's available in local stores as well. You'll pay more for it if you don't buy it directly from the farm, but it's there. Um, even places like Whole Foods, you know, will have a whole section now that's grass-fed beef and stuff, grass-fed yeah. bison. Um, and it's worth understanding why you're doing it and why it's important because I think this is the only way that we're going to repair this planet. So that's what you can do personally for it. Um, politically, there are a lot of really great groups that are trying to uh, do policy changes, you know, on a, on a big level. And that's what's going to have to happen. We have to understand farm policy. We have to understand the USDA. We have to understand the stranglehold that those six corporations have on the world food supply, and we're going to have to fight them. So get involved on that level. Um, a really great group that does a lot of advocacy is the Weston Price Foundation, and that's westonaprice.org. Um, and they have an entire legal arm of their organization that goes to bat for all of us in Washington. But yeah, it, these, are, these can be very technical issues. It can be really boring. But if we don't do it, no one else is going to. Because right now, money is winning. And land, animals, people, communities are all losing. So we, we really have to try to understand it at whatever level and try to get involved. I mean, a mid-range level is getting involved in your local school. Like, what are they eating and why? Why are these kids having to eat total crap? And now there's been this huge push for them to eat low-fat food. And it's, it's just the worst direction possible. Children need fat in their brains. Yeah. You're not going to have a healthy brain. And you only get one chance to build that brain. And it just breaks my heart that these kids are being forced to eat low-fat food in school. That's not the right direction. But why aren't they eating locally grown you know, full fat milk, full fat beef. Like that's what those kids need to, to, ha to build healthy bodies for the rest of their lives. So get in there and advocate for those kids. Like that's a really important thing that any of us can do no matter where we live. Leo, this is a great call uh, coming up on time, but we have a couple closing questions. The first one is looking back on this year, either 2015, 2016, what's been the biggest lesson you have learned? Gosh, <laughs> it, st it stumps just, a lot of people. Don't worry. Personally, or on a more political scale, it can be either or. Just your, your the first thing that pops to mind. The first thing that pops. Okay, um, that I was right to get dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my dogs have saved my soul. They are such wonderful creatures. You know, it's. And I'll tell you what it is. Every morning, my, the house that I live in right now has a really steep staircase up to the the second floor where my bedroom is and where my dogs sleep with me. And there's, it's so steep, it's like a ladder. Wow. And yeah. every morning, if and my dogs, they look at that and they're like, "Great, no problem. Give me another day. I'm for it." And they go barreling down that ladder head first, and they don't even think twice about it. And if I had to face that every morning, I would lay in bed and cry. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it just—I yeah. can't face that ladder. Going headfirst down a ladder every morning, I couldn't do it. Yeah, and, all and they're fours. just like, "Let's just do it. Give me another day." They're so excited to be alive. Yeah, they're so excited to be alive. So they're a recent and thing. You just got them. I got uh, my first dog a year and a half ago, and then uh, I got her brother Jamie actually almost a year ago exactly. So now I have two of these wonderful beasts in my life, and also their loyalty. I mean, beyond their optimism, they're so loyal. They're so smart. They understand things that I do not understand about the nature of the universe, and that's quite clear. Yeah. And it's just so great to have them around and just to have that kind of a connection that does, it's not about, you know, we, they don't, I mean, they know about 15 words in English, and I don't know any words in dog, but yet we communicate. 
Yeah. And I just love that we're able to have a really profound connection with each other. They adore me and I would lay down my life for them. You know, and one of my dogs, she had a terrible thing last month and she almost died out of nowhere. Um, and I just remember that that moment when you think, even if she dies, it was so worth it. Even if I spend the next year crying for this dog, it was so worth it to have that kind of love and that kind of loyalty, that mutual, you know, that we just adored each other like that is always worth it. And so love is worth it. And I know that sounds so corny, but if you want my life lesson for the last year, that's it. Love is always worth it. It doesn't matter. We know where it ends. Yeah, Everybody yeah. dies, right? Everybody gets sick. Everybody, it's life, right? Death is a part of it, but it's always worth it to love anyway. So, yeah. On a little more basic level, what you said about the communicating with the dogs, mm -hmm. I've always found really fascinating. Like when you hold out your hand and they can shake and they understand yeah. that, or when you say walk and they start wiggling and running around. So cool. I mean, that, that's communication right there. And, um, 15,000 years ago, we domesticated them, first animals. So it's. Oh, yeah. It's you can see why. Yeah, it's crazy. It They're is so nuts. so good. It's so many things. Lier, uh, your site is lierkeith.com. Is that the best place for people to find you and your work? Absolutely. And if they can't remember how to spell my name, honestly, if they just look up vegetarian myth on Google, they will get to me because okay. I'm it. <laughs> <laughs> or some or some angry sites or something. You will find some very horrible things about me as well. You look at those or not, I don't care. But as long as you at least go to my site and see what I'm about for real. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Lier. This is a You're great show. Um, learned a lot about farming and agriculture and, and uh, mineral deficiencies and some really fascinating stuff in here. So thanks. You're very welcome. Until next time. Hey, that was a fun one, right? I told you it was a interesting call. I really enjoyed talking to Lier again. Thank you. She sent me her book like two days after this, Express Mail. Really wanted me to have it. And I've been flipping through it and just been blown away by uh, the amalgamation of all this research in there. It's a thick book, it's dense, it's well-cited, it's well-written. She did a phenomenal job with it, so two thumbs up. PaleoHacks.com, again, go over there for our archives, recipes, and articles. Just tons and tons and tons of, of great content over there. PaleoHacks on social media, I believe Snapchat's the one we're using the most, and that's just at PaleoHacks, you can search by username. In other announcements, guys, um, you know, to get real for a second, on a on a serious note, this Paleo Hacks podcast. If you're still listening right now, uh, chances are you're a, you're a long time listener, or you're someone who appreciates this show, and I just wanted to really thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. And um, we've been doing the show for three years, I think over a hundred episodes or something like that. I started the show in college. You know, not knowing anything. Not that I know everything now, but hell of a lot more than I did when I was 19 doing this show. And this nervous kid interviewing all these people he read about finally got an opportunity to talk to them. And I was so ecstatic to do it. And so it was a good it was a good team. And um, I guess what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to say is this has been such a long journey, 100 episodes, three plus years in the making. I'm really proud of what we built at Paleo Hacks, but I think it's time for a change. And so the team and I at Paleo Hacks have decided to not produce the show any longer. Um, we have about, don't worry, we have about, I think, eight or so episodes recorded and ready. And that'll take us up until sometime in October. So I'll, I'll announce and I'll probably try and do something special for the last final show, um, working on some things in the works of like compounding the best lessons or it, it'll be something special for the last one for sure. But, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, we're both in this. It's not Clark got fired or, uh, Clark quit payload hacks or any of that. There's no bad blood at all. Still talk all the time. It's just time for, for both of us to make a change. I think they're going in a different direction with content. Uh, more recipes, articles, higher quality, everything like that. And, um, you know, long form interviews are a very niche, uh, to be perfectly honest, a very niche, long, time consuming piece of content. And with the internet changing and our attention spans shrinking, um, I think people are not consuming podcasts in the health field, at least 
at the rates that they used to maybe three or four years ago when it peaked. That's just to be brutally honest, guys. Um, so that's why, I mean, if you're listening right now to the, these very words, I appreciate you so much. And um, if you, if you want to, I'm still going to be around. I'm not going away. So if you want to continue this relationship, if you want to continue um, whatever it is, it's not a fan at all. I'm not that hot headed, but I would love to stay in contact with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shoot me an email, Clark at ClarkDanger.com, or get on my mailing list by downloading the 11 questions, change your life, um, ClarkDanger.com slash download. I plan on doing a lot in this world. I plan on doing great things. I plan on using this and going in a great direction. I'm really inspired. A couple things I got going on. I'm really excited to share them with you, and I would love, love, love your support in that, uh, especially if you've been listening for the last three or so years. But not to worry, last thing, all of our archives will still stay up for eternity. So if you're missing the show ever at, you know, when October comes to the end and you, man, where, where's the new episodes? Never fear, you can go back and listen to all hundred. That'll take you at the rate of one a week, what, two years to get through all of them again. So we can be together for two more years. All right. Um, that is it. Thank you so much for your support. I'll see you next Thursday. From the bottom of my heart, I love you and thanks for listening. Till then.